property fraud is as old as, well, the Old Testament. Some of you may recall the story of Jacob conning his father Isaac into giving him his older brother Esau's birthright, which presumably included the right to inherit the family property. Recently, however, scammers have come up with some new schemes that real estate lawyers should be on the lookout for. I'm Jeff M. Brown, legal writer with the State Bar of Wisconsin. With me today to talk about online real estate fraud is Sherry Hippenbecker, a lawyer who works for the Knight Berry Title Group. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity to be able to talk to the real estate attorneys here in the state of Wisconsin about seller impersonation fraud, which is the newest scheme that we're seeing from cyber criminals um, that has eked its way up to the state of Wisconsin. It started in Florida in you know January of 2022, so about a year ago. And as all good frauds, they all good frauds start in Florida and then they eventually get to Wisconsin. It's here. And I suspect it's here to stay until we educate enough people about this fraud and the criminals go away. Thus, this is the opportunity here to start education. Great. What are some of the red flags? And if you could maybe just describe what this how this works, because I think most of us have either been through a real estate closing ourselves or represented clients through real estate closing. And I know when we purchased the house that my wife and I live in, we actually went to the office and had our documents with us and the seller was there um, at, or the seller's representative, I don't recall now, but there were people sitting across the table in a, in a conference room. This must be something where that's not the case, correct? That's absolutely correct. So some uh, an online criminal identifies property. A lot of times it's vacant land um, and says, I'm going to try to sell this vacant land. I'm going to try to impersonate the seller. They fool. Many times they try to fool a realtor into listing that property. Realtor lists the property, finds a buyer, and then they work with a title company all electronically online um, to be able to eventually get the deed emailed to them, mm. signed, notarized, um, fraudulently and then sent back to the title company to record. They take in the buyer's money and they send the, the money to the fraudster rather than the real owner of the property. From from soup to nuts, they're impersonating the person that owns that real property and convincing and fooling people all along the way that they're the right person to be able to sign that deed. This is new to Wisconsin, but we've seen probably in the last month, my company's seen at least five of them and we've stopped all of them because we've trained our staff. So we wanted to bring this you know, to the broader, wider audience to describe it. Um, I'm just going to share my screen for a moment, Jeff. Great. We do have on our website, Nightberry's website, uh, we have um, an article about the seller impersonation fraud. Included in that article is a, a bulletin from the Secret Service about this because it's pretty rampant across the entire United States. It started in Florida, but, you know, the, the criminals saw that it was successful. So they said, why don't we go outside the state of Florida? What are we looking for? Well, this is these are the common red flags that we've trained our staff, and then we're hoping to make everybody else aware of it. First of all, the cyber criminals are really looking at unimproved or vacant land. And one of the reasons they're doing that is because they're trying to convince a realtor to list the property. And the first thing a realtor does, if you have improved occupied land, they're going to like, let me say, let me walk through the house. Let me walk through the building. And the cyber criminal certainly doesn't have the keys to the house or the building. So they're like, hey, it's vacant property. Go on that property whenever you want, realtor. And they try to convince them that way. Uh, hey, many um, times the properties... Sorry, go any, ahead. Any distinction? So I'm thinking um, unimproved land. Um, we sold a portion of the family farm well back after my father uh, died, and that was unimproved land. You could have a lot overlooking a lake. Uh, is there any distinction? Do they care a lot in a subdivision, or is it just unimproved land in general? Unimproved land. I mean, that's the easiest one for them to do it. And they can, because they can identify, look, nobody needs to meet a realtor or a buyer at the property and walk them through. They can say, just walk it on your own. So that's not, that isn't to say they're not going to go towards improved land. We had one the other day that there was on a, a property on a lake in Northern Wisconsin. It was the vacant lot. And right next door was the second home for the people that lived down in the Southeastern part of Wisconsin. And it was listed twice by two different realtors. And we kind of addressed that as well. Um, there's going to be communication between the fraudsters and whoever it is that they're trying to fool is primarily going to be by text or email, although the fraudsters have figured out a way to be able to pick up the phone and spoof a phone number and spoof a voice to be able to make that initial point of contact. And then from there forward, try to do email communication. Uh, typically, they want to do uh, the, the transaction as fast as possible because they realize the longer this is strung out, the more likelihood somebody is going to be able to catch the fraud. Um, Here's the big thing right here. Seller insists on identifying their own notary. Part of this fraud and the way it works is it 
we used to have this thing where we would email to people deeds for them to go find their own notary to be able to sign and send it back to us. That doesn't happen anymore. And at least at my company, we control the signing because we know that they're taking it. They're getting a fraudulent notary stamp and sending it back. So we say to know that anymore. And we use this tool called remote online notarization a lot as well. Um, obviously, the ID presented is a forgery. I have a tons of examples I can show people where we're getting fraudulent forged passports. And um, here's the end of the day. What, what are they really trying to do? They're trying to get funds, money wired to them that they can hold in their accounts. So they want funds wired. Sometimes it's domestically. Many times it's overseas. Any, so what are we doing? I'm sorry, go ahead. A couple, a couple of questions. Any, so with regard to the ID presented as a forgery, right? That used to be very easy. That's obviously more difficult now with, with driver's licenses. Some of the examples you showed in the materials you sent me ahead of this were, were passports. And not that it matters, but I'm just curious. You know, I think we've all seen the spy films where there's some old guy in a in a dank apartment in, in Amsterdam and he's got the monocle on and little tweezers and he's faking a passport, right? Uh, but that, you know, those are typically films from the 70s and 80s. It has, hasn't that gotten harder as well? And and how are they able to, to mock these things up? And is there any way to catch it at that stage? I'm sharing with you on my screen all of the alerts that we've received from Florida regarding seller impersonation fraud. It goes on and uh -huh. on and on. We're just going to go ahead and grab one of them. Mm -hmm. And many of the alerts show, and you can see, this is what I get on a daily basis. So I just throw it in here. And many of the alerts show, oh, there's the there's the fraudulently prepared passport that was provided. From Germany. Yep. Should we just randomly, I'm literally randomly. And, and I don't know what a German passport should or shouldn't sure. look like, right? How, I mean, unless I'm a customs agent. So that is one it didn't typically have a foreign one. passport? Uh, usually it's a foreign passport, but we've had domestic stuff as well. So I don't know. Oh, here's another one. Here's here's a domestic one. Speaking of, right. And nor nor do I know what what a Pennsylvania driver's license should look like, yeah. right? Are so, there any are there any countries to which they want the money wired more than more than others? And should you worry, say, the difference between Ghana versus Canada? Uh, you should always worry about uh, wiring internationally, in my mind, because the club, even Canada. Uh, even Canada, because your ability to be able to collect money once it's left the United States and left the control and domain of Secret Service or FBI is certainly limited by the country that you're going to. And then, frankly, actually, once the money is wired, it usually gets turned into cryptocurrency and goes into a crypto tumbler, and it's very difficult to be able to mm. recollect those funds. So um, international wiring is something you know we choose to uh, avoid um, because of concerns about that. But even if it's wired domestically, again, it'll be switched over into a cryptocurrency, crypto tumbler, and then it's, um, difficult, if not impossible to recover those funds. What is a crypto tumbler? Is that like the machine in the bank where you go dump your coins in and it spits <laughs> out a receipt? Is it something akin to that? Uh, so I am no it expert. I don't own any cryptocurrency in my stock, but that is my understanding. Okay. I mean, uh, we work with a company called certified, um, the general, it's the gentleman that works on that described it pretty much like that. And that's how I visualize the money goes in and it gets separated out. And you trying to follow going all those different ah. locations because there's how many types of different cryptocurrency too difficult to track down. And of course, you know, if it's outside the domain of the United States, you know, uh, we, we just don't have the recovery services that we have in sure. the United States. Going back to, so thank you for asking those questions. And of course, pop in, you know, this is it's, interesting, and, and scary stuff. The role of currency, is that why the Secret Service is involved? Because when you mentioned the Secret Service, I'm thinking back to that movie Firing Line, where people talk about the Secret Service being, you know, protecting the president and other, other elected officials and also um, counterfeiting. Yes, um, yes. It, okay. Yes. The Secret Service is... Is definitely um, the company, and the reason. Um, so the company that we we work with on on wire transfers um, and in issues to make sure they're done safely is called Certified, and they have a relationship with the Secret Service because the the Secret Service has relationships with many of the banks in the United States. So if money has been sent, the Secret Service can immediately go to that bank to the fraud department and put a halt on those funds mm -hmm. in that account. You know, I can't pick up a call call a bank and go stop 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 money in your account is fraudulent. Mm -hmm. They won't listen to me but they probably would listen to the Secret Service. Okay. So what are we doing to sniff and stop stop these frauds? Um, well, we're doing things like this at my company. We're trying to inform and educate mm -hmm. because the more people are aware of it, the more likely these criminals are going to stop because they're not going to be successful. Um, we always scrutinize uh, communications. Are we talking just emails and texts? Can we actually pick up the phone and call them or join them on a um, on a Zoom like we're doing right now? 
uh, we actually will send a letter out to the, if it's a vacant property, we'll look at the tax bill and we'll go, oh, the address where the tax bill is sent is not the address of the vacant property at someplace in Milwaukee. We'll send a letter out to the actual owner of the property in Milwaukee or if it's Ontario or if it's in Brazil, we've done it different places that says, hey, there's this fraud out there and we just want to make sure we're talking to the right owner of that real property. Um, and then we we cry your forms of ID. We try to have a video call. If money, if the deeds are ever sent to an embassy to be signed, we verify with the embassy or we do what I talked about earlier. We try to control the signing. We are the ones that want to set up who the notary is going to be, whether it's domestic or international. Uh, we try to use a remote online notarization. We just don't want to be fooled. So we're taking these extra steps to protect transactions, protect your clients, really just want to make you aware of this. Hopefully mm -hmm. you don't get affected by it, but it's here. It's here in Wisconsin starting in, you know, I think I saw my first one in October of 2022. It was a vacant lot uh, that was over $300,000, had been listed three different times for sale because three different realtors weren't aware of this, this new fraud that's going on. I don't blame the realtors at all because we need to educate. So we're trying to educate. So there's no database, single database, where you can go see who signed up to sell a piece of property, so, you know, such that one of those realtors could have gone on, typed in the, the address and seen, oh, realtor A and B are already signed up for this. Why am I being asked to? Yeah, I, I mean, the realtors certainly can look at MLS if they've been listed on MLS. The latest one that we had in northern Wisconsin had been listed on MLS. One of the realtors pulled it back. Another realtor was fooled, listed on MLS, and the first realtor reached out to the second realtor and said, hey, this was a fraud. Mm. Um, so sometimes that certainly helps. I mean, again, it's more about education and awareness. Sure. Uh, we had a deal last week in Florida where there were six vacant lots. The criminal reached out to three different realtors to list uh, two vacant lots. So uh, vacant lot one, two was listed with realtor one, three and four was listed with realtor three, two, and five and six with realtor um, three. They had uh, signed offers on all of those vacant lots and they'd gone to three different title companies to sell. And then we identified the issue, stopped it, and then reached out to the other title companies about the issue and the other realtors. Again, it's all about awareness. As, as people become aware, something seems fishy. Maybe there is. Maybe you got to dig a little deeper into it with some of those ideas that we suggested. And if anybody else has any other ideas how to stop this, please bring them on because these cyber criminals are pivoting and we need to pivot, pivot with them to stay ahead of them. Right, right. Really a cat and mouse game, eh? Are there? Do you know? Are there any ethical implications uh, about uh, around this sort of thing for lawyers that are representing clients in this situation? Um, I'm not. So, if you're representing a buyer um, and they get fooled into buying a property from a, 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 a somebody who's impersonating the seller, I, I I don't know if it's ethical per se, um, but uh, certainly that buyer is not going to be very pleased if they find out that they paid however much money for a property that they don't own. Right, right. So it sounds I don't know like maybe if that's the right answer to your question, but that's my right. thought. It sounds like maybe the thing to do with the due diligence uh, to be aware of is finding a title company that's up to speed on this, or or yeah. other other, uh, other non legal professionals that are up to speed on this. Right, and certainly if you have a seller coming in to a closing and signing a deed in your presence, feel pretty good about that. It's right. the other issues that can can uh, cause some dilemma. Well, so certainly there are there are legitimate. Uh, transactions where the seller isn't present or his or her representative isn't present and it's done online. How today, you know, what do you see? How how many transactions, legitimate ones, right? How many have that scenario where there's a, it's done, part of it's done online or the seller isn't present? Sure. Um, we do remote online notarization all the time where a deed is executed by a seller remotely using not Zoom, but, you know, some sort of interactive system like this. Um, it's certainly more frequent in Florida. We have offices in Florida and there's a lot of second properties there, northern part of Wisconsin where there's second homes as well. But, you know, if you're talking about good old, I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I live in Wind Lake, I'm probably showing up to the closing if I'm the seller. So mm -hmm. I don't want to put a, a percentage on it because it really depends on the locale that you're talking about. I see. That's what drives it. Places where there tend to be second properties. Arizona, big for example. Yeah. 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 Kind of place I fantasize about moving to when it's a day like today when it's cold and snowy. Great. Well, Sherry, thanks for the uh, thanks for the tips and the advice and uh, the words of wisdom. What to watch out for. Uh, really enjoyed speaking with you and uh, keep your eyes peeled. I guess. Thank you for the opportunity. We'll keep pivoting. Let us know if you see anything else that's out there. Okay. Thanks again. Bye bye.